Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Redemption Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of human redemption that govern the operation of God's laws, gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws, and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 12th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Yesterday, one, it's interesting, one of the most important days for your own welfare, and yet one of the days where you got heavily shut down as a group. So it's telling you that you're resistive to doing things even to your own good. That means you must be getting externally influenced quite a lot, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. What we notice, uh, what we notice, has been happening a lot too when we have these groups and then people book in, and then in the last month before the group, heaps of people cancel, and it's actually very unlovely. We'll talk about that later, but. Um, but a lot of the cancellations are because people are getting attacked spirit by spirits, trying to stop those you from coming along to the groups to learn more. And, uh, and most of the people who counsel always finish up saying, oh, yeah, but I felt under a lot of pressure and I felt it was like, you know, and I just felt like I had to. And really all that's doing is just giving away your desire to a spirit. That's really all it's doing. It's quite sad. Happens a lot on the planet, obviously, doesn't it? giving away the desire to a spirit or, or doing what and, and, and therefore doing what the spirit wants you to do in order just to get your addictions met rather than feeling like you're getting attacked. So this is where I've said in the last group that getting attacked is a good sign in a lot of ways, doesn't it? It's a good sign that you're starting to engage your will and starting to really engage your desire, which is the real key thing we need to engage. Well, will and desire have a large amount of uh, influence on this principle as well. The human redemption principles, which is what we want to talk about with you straight away this morning. These are, these are some of the most loving principles God has ever supplied to us, actually. And unfortunately, many religious organisations on the planet would suggest to you that such principles don't exist. And in other words, they suggest that when you degrade your condition to a certain point and then you pass, then that's it. You're locked in the hells for the rest of your existence. And that suggestion is actually against this principle. God doesn't need... And also there's other things religiously that are against the principle. There are many religions that say that God eventually is going to come and destroy the wicked. Now that is also against this principle. This principle basically states that the wicked will be redeemed. In other words, the wicked will eventually become righteous again. So this principle is a very important principle and it will help you also understand um, sort of the anger that's involved in many religious things that are going on on earth, causing people to believe that, no, you do something wrong, that's the end of it. You know, that we have no more to do with you. That, and God is not like that. God only does ha not have things to do with you until such a point as you want to engage again. And then God obviously starts to have things to do with you again. And that's the illustration that I gave in the first century when I talked about the prodigal son. Many of you who are Christian remember that illustration? Yep. So my suggestion to those of you who aren't, find reference in the Bible to the prodigal son and have a read of it. Because that is all about the process of redemption. Mm. Anyway, let's uh, move forward and see the terms that we're going to look at with regard to this principle. So sin, we've defined sin before, but let's remind ourselves that sin is the existence of will or desire and desire in disharmony with God's principles, whether the will or desire is acted upon or not. So that's sin. And notice in particular the bit whether it's acted upon or not very important part of our understanding of sin. Human redemption is the process of paying the penalty for sin and removing sin from the human soul in order to recover the human soul back to its created pristine condition. Now, sin is a will-based 
And we'll talk more about this because I still feel there's some confusion between will and desire for many of you. And it's a will-based process that involves the enforced painful experience and release of sin-related emotion. Now, remember yesterday we, we broke up some of the parts of the soul into two areas. These two areas of will and desire. Remember we did that? Yep. And remember with will, we, we looked at what this was what our current condition is. Right? Now the will principles act upon the current condition. The desire principles don't act upon the current condition though. The desire principles that we learned about yesterday act upon our faith. In other words, our truly believed future possible condition. The things that we have not yet obtained, but we have deep conviction internally, deep conviction through proof that we will obtain them. Right? That's our faith. So our desire acts upon faith. Our, will, uh, our desire, in fact, is faith being exercised. And will is just our current condition, whatever that may be. So what we're saying here is human redemption is a will-based. So in other words, it's acting upon your current condition. It's will-based, acting upon your current condition. Self-reliant process that involves the enforced painful experience and release of sin-related emotions. So when, this, when your current condition gathers sin, all of God's laws now through the redemption process are trying to help you remove this sin. That makes sense? They're trying to help you get rid of this sin now from the moment you incur the sin or even, if you think about it, the desire processes even try to get rid of it before you even incur the sin. Because a desire to sin usually has to happen before you sin. Do you see that? So, so we can have sin in our desire and we can have sin in our will. Our will being our current condition and our desire being our future aspired to state. And there can be sin in your desire in the sense that you want to do something that's unloving and you feel like you want to do it. Right? Whenever you have an addiction you want met, that's what you're doing. You have a desire that's unloving and you have a feeling you want to do it. That, that is a sin exercised by desire. So the desire principles try to work upon that before you even sin. Isn't that wonderful? Because that, that means that God's already trying to correct even your thought to sin, let alone your actual sin. Right? But once this, uh, the desire, as, we, as the Bible actually says in one verse, gives birth to sin, you understand that term? That's what it really is, isn't it? The desire motivates you to eventually engage the sin. So you could say the desire is giving birth to sin. You've ignored the desire principles trying to correct your desire in that place. And then you've engaged sin itself by having the thought and, and maintaining the thought, emotion, uh, action, words or whatever it is. That now has meant that you've sinned. You've acted out of harmony with God's condi condition of love, God's principles. So now we have the sin within us. What do we do with it? Now, if God never engaged these redemption principles, if God never had them, the sin would probably stay within you for the rest of your existence. Right? And the compensation would continuously act upon the condition of sin as well for the rest of your existence. Under those circumstances, hell would have been a permanent place. Can you see? Now, now God is going, well, I don't want to make a permanent place for hell. I want to make it so that if someone gets themselves there, then they can also get themselves out of there. Does that make sense? So this uh, redemption principles give you hope in a lot of ways, that your original pristine condition can be obtained again. And by original pristine position, uh, condition, we're talking about the perfect natural human condition, which is what you have the instant that you are born on, it, it conceived on this planet. You have it then, but a moment after then, you start absorbing the 
current condition of the world, but just before then, that's your condition. So that's the condition that you actually have. Now, it's interesting also, because of the condition of many spirits in the spirit world, they can't even see the soul of the baby being conceived. And the reason why they can't is that it's so bright that they can't see it. Right? And this is why many of them attempt reincarnation. Right? Because they can't even see the soul and they see a body, two bodies in fact, prepared, and they think there's no soul attached there. I can't see one, so I'm going to dive in there. And they overcloak the baby in its womb even. Right? Now that's because the sin-based condition also darkens. So it's a process that darkens not only your own soul, but it also darkens all your perceptions. And one of your perceptions happens to be all of your senses, including sight, taste, smell and so forth. So sin darkens these perceptions so you actually tolerate more and more smelly environments you'll tolerate darker environments you'll tolerate environments where you can't really see that much of what's going on and so forth and if you pass as a, in that state as a sp into a spirit world then of course your perception is also badly influenced by this condition of darkness that is in you right? now if we've used our will in that way to create sin so that it's dark in our soul, and everyone on the planet does because we're always usually in, in addiction of some kind, so therefore we are engaging this process of self-degradation, then by the time we've got to that point, you imagine if there was no redemption. then you'd be basically be permanently at that point for the rest of your existence. Now that would be torture, would it not? really, it would be torture to remain in that kind of a condition for the rest of your existence, for the rest of your whole life. So that's a very important thing that we understand that it, this, the laws are going to now trigger feelings about this condition. Feelings that eventually will well up inside of you and you have to experience them. But it's a forced emotional experience by the law. The law is forcing you to go through some emotional experience. Now, many of you have experienced this already on Earth, when you've had a relationship breakup or other things like that that occur that have been quite traumatic to you, maybe even the death of a loved one occur and there's a lot of trauma involved. It's caused emotions to well up in you that have always been there, but now you're triggered into experiencing them through what's happened, through the external events that have occurred. And that will occur more even after you pass. Uh, there will be external events, a heightening of those external events as the law of attraction heightens up, so too the external events heighten up. And so you finish up with event after event after event after event that eventually you get tired of and you start letting go emotionally about it how tired you are. Now, the first emotion that most people feel in the spirit world is the emotion of anger. And this is the emotion many of you are resistive to feeling here. And that's one of the emotions that does need to be feel, felt. But anger is the result of this sins now being triggered by this painful emotional experience. It's trying, God's principle of redemption is trying to move you into that place where first you deal with your anger, then you deal with your fear, and then you deal with your sadness and so forth. The layers of emotion that are controlled will automatically start popping out of you, whether you like it or not, because you'll be involved in so many traumatic events that eventually you'll get tired of it and therefore start to release things emotionally naturally. Does that make sense? But that there is no desire there to do it. Can you see? There's no desire. It's just a will-based thing where your will is going, oh, i just got to let this go. And there's no desire to let it go. You're getting forced to let it go through events. The redemption process, the principles, are forcing the events upon you through the compensatory effects of your own choices and decisions. So it's not like anyone else has control of it. You do. But the principle is forcing upon you this, this feeling eventually that will come over you of, I give up, I'm just going to let go of some emotion. Right? That's a not, not a desire-based process, but a will-based process where your will is just being forced to do what, what your current condition demands of you. 
So do you understand the difference there? So that's human redemption. Very important part, this last one. Forgiveness is accomplished through emotional forgetfulness of past sin and correction of the desire to sin. So you are treated as if you are forgiven when you no longer remember the emotions associated with what you've done. Now that doesn't mean you're in denial of them. You're completely open to them but you no longer remember them because you've cried so much about the issue that now the issue is gone from you. Or you've, you know, initially you might have got angry about the issue so much until your anger exhausts itself and then the issue is gone from you. And then you might have fear and you might go into these terrible fear fits for many, I've seen many spirits do it for hundreds of years where they have basically fear fits that last hundreds of years. Right, you imagine it is quite terrifying, right? But they release that fear eventually, and eventually they exhaust the fear, and the fear is gone from them. So now they are in a place of forgetfulness of the fear. Now they are forgiven. Does that make sense? That's the ro the process of forgiveness when it comes to using this will-based human redemption process. This will-based, remember human redemption process. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at the next type of redemption. This one involves desire. So divine redemption occurs by desiring a personal relationship with God and willfully desiring and engaging God's help to remove the effects of sin and the desire to sin from the soul. So this is where now we have faith that God can help me in the process and a lot of our feelings are projected at God, wanting God to forgive us for what we have done. Realising, as we said here, that only God can remove all the effects of sin. And this part places a desire-based part of sin. This is, this is not one where we're being forced to do it by the law, where the, this law, the law of desire, interacts with this law of redemption, the principles of redemption, allowing us... So desire principles, interacting with redemption principles, allow us now to desire the release of sin. That means a preparedness to actually feel every emotion if we have to. Now, the irony of this desire-based process is it engages other laws and then it also engages God's heart. And therefore, you end up not having to go through the same traumatic experience as you would have had to do when you were in this state. So something that might last hundreds of years to release here might only be one or two years or less here. Does that make sense? But a much, it's a much smoother uh, and also much more, uh, it feels much more, of course, loving and caring process, but it is, is dependent upon your desire. Does that make sense? So when we refer to divine redemption, which again is just a term we've invented, right, to describe a process, we're referring to how that divine redemption interacts with desire and human redemption, the one that we saw beforehand, interacts with a lack of desire, just your current will condition, but no desire. Does that make sense? Tristan, you'd like to ask? Um, so what you're saying is when you're interacting with, desire, um, with divine redemption, you have to be ready to feel all the emotions that you would feel in a human redemption. Correct. You can't just pretend that you're going to feel okay. those. Things. Correct. Or want to get away with it. Yeah. yeah. You think God that, in that would addiction. indicate an insincere desire. Yeah. Therefore, you're going to have that process. Does that make sense? Yep. Good question. So here we are. Is where we're in this human redemption process or the divine redemption process, depending upon whether we're choosing to do it or whether it's just forced upon us by our build up, the build, internal build-up of unwelcome emotion eventually just bursting like a volcano, you know, coming out of us and, and we just surrender to the process, you know, that's, a, that's human redemption. Now, divine redemption also has some additional things that we need to take note of and that is that it's a God-reliant process driven by desire that involves awakening to sin. So at, you've got a desire to know about your sin before you can actually feel about it, can you see? So, so this is why in the Paget messages in particular it talks about 
you must first awaken to sin by yourself. That is not something God is going to force upon you either, although the laws are trying to get you to that condition of awakening to sin. But once you've awakened to sin and you become emotionally repentant, so you, want, you feel sorrow in that place for what you've done, now this divine redemption process can be engaged. And forgiveness is really accomplished by God responding to your desire and helping you through each emotion and also as you go through each emotion, helping you to see, recognise and feel the cause. See, in this process, you have to do that all alone, by yourself, with no help or assistance at all. There's often spirits trying to help you, but in that place, remember, you're pretty resistive because all you're reliant on is the fact that you're getting forced into it. All right? Now, in that place, in the spirit world, there's literally like a scroll of all of the deeds you've done that you're paying the penalty for. And once you've finished the penalty for one, that scroll deletes that one. And then you're on the next one, and the next one, and the next one. All right? Now, you imagine someone like Herod, historically, or some other person who's been quite, you know, uh, what, what I would say is overwhelmingly destructive on the planet. You imagine what their list is. Someone like Stalin, imagine what their list is. Someone like Hitler, imagine what their list is. Long list. But you'll be surprised how many average people on this planet have a very long list. Uh, because remember, the list also measures your desires, not just what you've done. And there's many people who desire to do quite evil things without actually doing it. And in fact, when they pass into the spirit world, you know what normally happens to those people? Is they do it anyway. Because there, there they feel they can get away with it. So the very first part of their life in the spirit world is generally surrounding the earth and doing a whole heap of bad things which actually demonstrate that their desire wasn't pure, but rather, to, in other words, their desire to not sin wasn't pure, but rather they had a desire to sin, they just didn't do it because they were afraid of getting caught. And once they pass in the spirit world, they're no longer afraid of getting caught, so they do it. But their cushion condition continues to degrade and degrade until the pain of the emotions being stored by that condition get to such a point that they start coming out. Uh, and then they're involved. They start then this will-based redemption process and usually that's when they stop surrounding the earth. That's when they stop being on the earth and stop, stop being earthbound. Until then they're generally earthbound acting out these unhealed emotional desires that have turned into sin because they've engaged sin. The divine redemption, the opposite of that, this one is saying, I want to know what I'm doing wrong, I want to be able to see it, I want to understand it, and I want to deal with it so that I change. Does that make sense? Yeah? So come on. Let's... No. Sorry, Karina. Carol. Sorry, Carol. Um, so you're saying that it's actually a physical scroll that we see with our spirit eyes. Yeah, yeah. And does that... Um, just, like, just like every act you have creates a home for you in the spirit world, so to every act you create creates a record of that act. Right. So... Is that not... Has that not been clear from previous yeah. <laughs> discussions? Yeah, but do we see that scroll when we go to our home that, that we've made for ourselves well most of us don't finish up having a home in the spirit world because our deeds mm -hmm. have been so dark that we end up with very little or no home so yeah. if we were to choose to to be earthbound mm -hmm. would we still see that scroll in that condition no we only see it in this in the spirit world you only you only see it when you stop sinning you only see it when you stop creating more sin because before then, you're blind to it. You just want to create more sin. This is the problem with your addictions, you see. While you're in your addictions, you want to create more sin. You don't care. Let's face it. When you're in your addiction, you don't really care, do you? You don't really care what the results are. In that place, you're blind to the results. Therefore, you're blind to the record. But once you stop sinning, now you'll become open. You'll, you'll start to see the record that's before you. Now, you can do that on earth, of course, see the record. But you, and certainly feel the record, but 
through this desire process, but the majority don't do it. They, they pass, they're earthbound for a period of time until they get to the point where they're so exhausted from their sin that they stop sinning. And once they stop sinning, then the record appears. Then they see their sin. Thank you. Does that make sense? Thank you. Then they have to pay the penalty for their sin. We haven't even got to the description yet. <laughs> All right, let's move forward, hey? So during God's divine redemption, we receive God's truth on all matters and the soul is prepared to open itself up to receiving God's love and therefore opening itself up to being, becoming immortal, right? So let's look at the principle itself and how it works. It enforces compensation upon will and desire. So you can see here that there's a measure of these two things, basically. One, on one side, there's the will-based principles interacting with redemption that allow for us to, to measure will. And on the other hand, there's desire principles we talked about yesterday interacting with the redemption process that then interacts with desire. So it enforces compensation upon both processes, will and desire. Remember, compensation is positive and negative. Right, so... so Fortunately, right? because otherwise every good deed would be punished or not recognised and that's not what God wants. God wants to recognise every good deed you do as well as recognise every bad deed you do. God's just, he's not unfair. He's not going to say, well you did 15 bad deeds and you did one good deed but that's, you know, what's the point of doing that good deed? You might as well throw that out the window. That's not how God is. God recognises every deed. It ensures redemption of the soul's will to recover the soul back to its pristine created condition. So here we're saying it ensures that the will gets redeemed. In other words, your current condition gets redeemed through a forced process of experiencing your emotion to recover you back to your pristine condition. Or it encourages desire for divine redemption. To begin and establish and grow a relationship with God a, and, a pre, and precondition the soul for transformation. In fact, without redemption, transformation is impossible. So we need to be redeemed before we can be transformed. And so this is a part of the process that we engaged. Desire engages that. So now desire is acting with redemption. And we get now a desire-based process, which is much more rapid, much more easier on the soul but if, if you feel that you're going to do it so that it's easier on the soul it's not going to work for you because you're still in this condition see it's a, the soul in this condition doesn't expect it they desire it and many of you expect it and I'm sorry if you expect it you're in here you're in this process it's when you truly desire it, when you truly desire to pay the penalty for all your sin and you truly desire to know what the causes of those sins were, now you're engaging this process. But only then. No matter what the consequence, even if you had to, pay, even if you had to go through the same process as here, you choose, you choose to desire that process, now you're in the right space and God's going, I love this space. Because this space is a space of humility. Right? It's a space of openness to be told. It's a space of desiring truth. It's a space of self-responsibility. This is not a space of self-responsibility. It's enforced responsibility. Remember, the responsibility principle state that responsibility will be enforced upon the soul. That's that place. Self-responsibility is you desiring responsibility, which is more like that place. Can you see? See all the relationships of some of these principles working together now. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to skip some of the examples because I've only got a few minutes. But maybe if we still visit the gravity and aerodynamics example, each physical property law has built in properties which examine the attention and motivation of the human. So, gravity. Even though it's a physical law, it does measure the intention and motivation, in other words, the desire of the human. 
it measures their will and their desire, in fact. All of the principles, of course, up to this point are merged. So what happens if the law is willfully broken with intent to harm oneself or another soul, then there are very severe impenities imposed upon the soul for breaking the law of gravity that exceed the physical penalty of the gravity law being broken. And this is the redemption, compensation, responsibility principles all now being merged into the law. So even physical laws have soul-based consequences. That makes sense? Important to remember. And so these penalties are enforced upon the, imposed upon the soul with that intention and motivation, even if the intention was only felt and not acted upon. Of course, there's degrees, isn't there? There's, you could think it, but not feel it. You could feel it, but not act upon it. Or you could think, feel it, and act upon it. And obviously, those three things will be much more difficult to compensate for than if you just felt it and, or thought it, obviously. But once you act, obviously, that's the very worst thing you could have done with that particular desire that's out of harmony with love. So the law corrects it. Now, man, there's so many good ones here I could mention. and just uh, Maybe I need to skip compensation because we've discussed compensation. Yeah, let's go to the development of a relationship with God one, hey? Because I've only got a few minutes left. Redemption principles ensure the human can not only redeem self without God's assistance, so that's this process, redeeming self without God's assistance. It's a forced redemption process triggering your emotional state and it's like an explosion of, or like a volcano of different emotions arriving under certain circumstances that get triggered through the law of attraction operating upon your current soul condition, in other words, your will. So that's that process. Now, that was a long statement I just made, and many of you are going to have to go back on that and listen to that again. All right? The second part of it, though, is that this part of it educates us about the necessity to engage desire so that we're pulled by our desire for a complete relationship with God to begin the pro transformational process, which involves redeeming ourselves from our sinful state into the perfect person, but then also being able to receive love from God during that process, right from the point of sin, from the point of sinful condition onwards. So this desire-based process is a very, very good process for us to engage, but it does require huge amounts of humility and sincerity and this is where most of us fall short because we always have and we have a tendency to have um, what I would classify as insincere emotions and we often have a lot of false beliefs about our personal sincerity now God measures the truth about our sincerity not what you believe your sincerity actually is so we get lots and lots of emails with people saying to us, we were dealing with a few this morning even, with people saying to us, uh, you know, I am really sincere, I really appreciate what you're doing for me, and then we give them a bit of feedback and bang, they're on us like a ton of bricks, right? Where's the sincerity? So they, they just want to believe they're sincere. A person who's sincere doesn't react angrily to a little bit of feedback. Like, most of you couldn't cope with living in our home for that reason, right? Because there's constant, 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 constant feedback. And many of you think that would be a nightmare, but it's actually wonderful. Myself and Mary love it because we have desire-based desire for our own redemption, right? Okay, let's look at the development of relationship with God. Redemption principles allow the human to see that it needs God in order to complete the process of full redemption. Uh, it's very interesting. If you examine the way God's constructed the spheres that are around this earth, around this, this universal portion, we'll talk about the multi-universals later, but here, here we have, like, let's say, one, two, there's the earth, one, two, three, four, and so forth, up to seven, right? And remember, it's one, uh, one two, three, four, five, six. So there's six, there's the seventh, and there's the eighth. Now, the eighth 
Sev the transition between the seventh and the eighth is, as you've already learned, the at one moment transition, right? With God, with in love. There's many other transitions that cause us to become a one at one with God in other things. But that's the at one moment with God in love. So but see the sixth sphere, that's the perfect natural man. Now that should tell you something because there's a seventh sphere. So what's the seventh sphere addressing? Can you see? It's, it's purifying your desire for God. That's what it's doing. That's why it's there. It purifies, makes more sincere your desire for God. So, so development of the relationship with God, if you start developing your relationship with God right down here, right in the first sphere, remember this is say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and so forth, if you start it right down in the first sphere, start developing this relationship with God, you start building upon this thing that you're going to need for the seventh sphere, which is desire to actually work your way through everything so that you can become redeemed and then one with God, right? That's what you're trying to do. Now, if you start recognising in this place that you need God to transform. See, a person who's a, who does the six fear process, the will-based process, is refusing to acknowledge that they need God to transform. Therefore, they sin against the Holy Spirit. They sin against the very mechanism, the conduit by which God can connect to them and give them some love. Right? So can you see, start seeing the relationship of how things work here with redemption principles, with what you've learnt in the past regarding construction of the spheres and so forth? It's all fairly clear, isn't it? Now, I've also drawn these spheres uh, in concentric circles here, which is not how they actually are, obviously. All right. That raises some questions about how it actually is, doesn't it? <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Most of the things I've illustrated with you to this point have been an attempt to get you to conceptualise what you're going to need to do with regard to love, right? So many of the things that I've drawn, you've then taken very literally when I'm just trying to use them as an illust for illustrative purposes to help you understand where you need to go. And the actual design of the universe is far more complicated than just a series of concentric rings like an onion layers going outwards into the universe. It's actually a lot more structured than that, as you can imagine. And in fact, it's clustered, which we'll talk about also later, maybe, if we get the chance. OK, so what have we learned about the redemption principles? They work upon either my will, right, to recover myself back to the pristine created condition, which is the six sphere condition, or they exercise upon my desire to begin the process of relationship with God and redeem ourselves with God's help. Now, doing something with God's help is much more quick, quickly achieved than doing something through your own personal experience, right? Now that would naturally follow since God is the infinite being and we are finite. Anything that gets help from God means that God's got a lot of control over how he can help us and assist us when, when here we're just doing it by ourselves. And, and usually here we're being forced as well. So that means we're even resistive to somebody come up to us saying, you just sinned. We're even resistive to that. We don't even want to hear that. So if you find you don't want to hear that you've sinned, then you're, you're there, right? Now that puts most of people who are hearing divine truth in that category, does it not? Yes. So you can see straight away that many of us have yet to engage the desire-based process. It would greatly benefit us if we did, but because we haven't believed, and still many of us don't believe in the desire principles, we don't believe that God rewards desire. We don't believe there's benefits to exercising desire rather than be forced into things. That's really, fundamentally, a lack of trust in God, is it not? A lack of trust in God's goodness. Hence, the reason why we'd finish up doing it all ourselves. So, we see that 
these principles speed the desire, divine redemption, the desire based process, speeds the emotional recovery of the soul. And it also prepares the soul for what's ahead of it, the transformational process. Whereas if you just engage in the human will based process, the human redemption process, it doesn't yet prepare you for the transformational process. It just gets rid of or erases past error, past sin. That's all it does. It doesn't actually prepare you. Whereas if you engage the divine redemption process, you get prepared for what's ahead of you. And God's in, in fact telling you something in that. He's saying to you, you're beyond the sixth dimension, you're going to need parts of me to understand me. Now that makes sense, does it not? You're going to need to have parts of God in you before you're going to understand the infinite being that God is. And so the divine redemption process, you start acknowledging that and desiring that, whereas the human redemption process basically says, I don't want to acknowledge that. I want to think that I can accomplish all of this by my own self. And so we get a lot of spirits who are in the sixth sphere or sixth dimension of the spirit world and they are just focused totally on shifting from one place to another, thinking they're developing, but all they're doing is moving sideways because they are yet to understand the fundamental truth of the universe, which is God is an infinite being and unless if we want to ever grow beyond the sixth dimensional limited space, the human natural condition, we must receive a part of God to do it. It's our only choice. And God made it that way purposefully because the truth is that anything above that sixth dimension cannot be understood without there being some divinity in you. So there's many spirits trying to understand, but none of them can unless they engage this desire, redemp the divine redemption, the desire-based process. Now we can go through the attitudes again, can't we? But literally there's so many of them, <laughs> so many attitudes that, we, that would indicate that they're against these principles, isn't there? Even just rejecting the concept of sin is against the principle. Now pretty much the whole planet who's, is in that concept, or they willfully sin, or they sin mistakenly thinking that they're not sinning. Or they reject God's definition of love. They retain the human de definition. They reject desire-based repentance. Man, there's so many, oops, so many things that we can do. And uh, this list could be like thousands of pages long, to be honest, of things that we do to reject these principles. Hence, some of the most important principles you can ever learn to bring your soul into harmony with. Yeah. All right, well, that brings us to the end of the discussion part of it. So what we'll do now, myself and Lena, is we'll just have a quick transfer over and then we'll get stuck onto some of the questions that you guys have raised, which I have here. Okay, so we're now doing the human redemption principles question and answer. We're going to start with Patty. Thank you, Patty. What would you like to ask? I think um, you've got uh, quite a number of okay. questions from what I saw. If we can start with your... Um, question number two. Yes. Is that okay? Is it accurate to feel that the redemption principles are the sum of all of the foundation, order, and soul principles with the objective to guide humans to desire a relationship with God? Um, not quite the language I would use, uh, as you have put in your question. In it, you've said that redemption principles are the sum of the foundation, order and soul principles. Mm -hmm. They are not the sum of them. They combine all of the foundation principles and all of the order principles and the desire and will principles in order uh, with the redemption principle. So each principle is on its own a, sta a freestanding principle. Do you understand? And the redemption principle is a freestanding principle. But the other principles all guide its operation. So this is where all the principles are interwoven like a lattice. 
Okay. Do, do you understand? Yes. It's not, so it's not accurate to call them a sum total. So it's not like all of the foundation principles we've discussed and all of the order principles we've discussed and all the, all the soul-based principles we will discuss are adding up to make the redemption principle. It's not mm -hmm. like that at all. But the redemption principle interacts with every other principle in order to create redemption, the possibility of redemption. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, so it's just a conceptual yeah. uh, reframing, I suppose you could say, of, of, of your question in order to help you understand what, what's really going on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, now, Jane, could we do your first question that you had yesterday, that you wrote yesterday or this morning, um, not the one you just wrote just right now? So you've had you have a total of three, and I want to do the first one first. Can you? It's is a is it a human law hangover? It's that one. Uh, do you remember it? No. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll say it for you then. Is that all right? Oh. Oh. Okay. I see it. You see it. Good eye. Eh? Fire away. Is it a human law hangover to think or feel that we have to figure out the causal emotion before we can choose to use our will differently. Um, now let's look at the statement, choose to use our will differently. Can you choose to use your will differently? No. No, because your will is your, your current condition. You can't use it, choose to use it differently. It is what it is. Does that make sense? Yes. What is it that you choose to use differently? Desire. Desire. Okay, so we need to make sure that it's the desire principle we're trying to engage here, not the will principle. You can't choose to use your will differently. To do that would be willpowering your way through something. This is about developing a faith-based desire to do something different. Does that make sense? Which, yes. which can be developed even though you have a will saying, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> You follow? Yes. Do what you're currently doing. This is what your will saying. Do what you're currently doing. Your desire can either say, do what you're currently doing, or do something worse than you're currently doing, or do something better than you're currently doing. That's the desire principle. So if we want to be pedantic about it, we really need to say, is it a human law hangover to think, feel that we have to figure out the causal emotion before we can use our desire? Well, now when you term it like that, you can see, obviously not. It's not, a will, it's not a human law hangover that's controlling us. It's our lack of true desire, our lack of faith. Can you see the importance of faith? Absolutely. It's the lack of faith that causes us to think, feel we have to figure out things before we engage desires. Right? And this is what I notice many of you doing, is you, you, you think you've got to figure out all your emotions before you engage a loving action. No, you don't. Just engage the loving action. God's laws will come and show you what your desires are, whether they're pure or not. And God's laws will also, are also already operating to expose your current condition to you. So you don't have to worry about that. God's laws are going to do that for you. <laughs> you follow? If you can engage a loving faith-based desire, now you've got the prospect of engaging two sets of principles to expose to you your condition, not just one. See, before then, you're actually here, not engaging any desire, and therefore only one principle can act upon correction for your soul. But if you actually engage desire, now two principles are going to be acting upon correction to your soul. You've got double the chance to find out what the problem is. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and, and it's literally like that. It's only when you see desire and then you act upon desire and you, you start working out whether the desire is in or harmony with love because now you, the feedback on your desire is now working in addition to the feedback on your current state. You follow? Yes. So it's like multiple feedback systems feeding back into your experience then instead of you just having a single feedback experience which is telling you only one thing, that your current condition is not that good. Right? This one will tell you whether your desire is good. That's, that's very, that's a great amount, of, that's good information to know, right? Because if you're getting told your, your current condition is bad and your desire is not so good either, where are you headed? Degradation. But if your current condition is not that good, but you're, you're getting feedback from the universe around you that your desire is, where are you headed? Into a, evolution proper you know positive evolution aren't you 
that's where you're headed. So very important that you understand the difference between those two things, Jane. This, this desire-based process is not having to use our will differently. It's, it's understanding that our will is what it is. The only thing I can really do to change it is to change my desire. In other words, use my desire differently. And that's all about developing this quality of faith so that you have a pure, s sincere emotion to use that differently, isn't it? That makes sense to you? Yes, yeah. it does. Thank so you. now we're starting to refine a little bit of what we learnt in our first group. Can you see that? In the first group, we were talking about will as a mixture of will and desire, which actually in your soul, there is a mixture of these two things, obviously. But you need to understand that the will principles operate upon the will part of your soul and the desire principles operate upon the desire part of your soul. And the two can be different, and in fact, they have to be different if you're going to change. Yep. So, good question. Okay, so I'll just mark... Jane off number one, this question is answered. I'm marking off questions so that the girls can actually tag these questions for later. Okay, now um, if I can go to Robert G, where are you, Robert Griffiths? Yep, you've got the mic, so that's good. And on the other side is, where's Rita? Rita's on the other side. If you can go up to Rita. Rita, if I can just point out to you, every single question you have... No, don't stand up yet because I'm going to Robert first. Every single question you've had is, driven, is asked by a spirit, actually. You, you have no idea how spirit-influenced you are asking these questions, but we'll talk about that a little as well. So could we go to Robert, your question? Do you remember it? I have no idea. No worries. Yeah. I'll say it for you then. Thanks. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> you said... Could you give an example of how God's law addresses both cause and effect of sin and how it operates upon the soul, attitude, character, thoughts and emotions as well as the action taken? Now, this is a little bit more related to yesterday's discussions, but I thought it, does involve, it is involved in these human redemption principles in that we, we need to understand how God's law operates and addresses the effect of sin. Now... I can go into it mathematically with you, perhaps, but the trouble is that's... Uh, I've actually got a question here saying, please don't go into it mathematically with me <laughs> <laughs> from, from somebody else. So, <laughs> so obviously that there's an issue with the mathematics. Uh, and an issue with mathematics is an issue with one form or method that God uses to communicate with you. So my suggestion is try to address that <laughs> as soon as you can. So let's look at it from what I've already explained to you. I've already said to you that each of God's laws measures every single little tiny piece of energy that runs inside of God. Now, God being the infinite being he is, means that every single universe, every single, even all, of, all of the stuff that belongs to God, like his personality nature and the principles, they all belong to God, but everything else laws and all of those other things under the law which is all creation has energy flow remember we said that right back in the scope we said that each each creation has energy flow and your you being the highest of god's creation have different forms of energy flow that occur within your soul a thought is a form of energy flow does that make sense a feeling is a thought is a form of energy flow an attitude is a form of energy flow. A belief is a form of energy flow. Because it's a form of energy flow, it can be measured by the law. Yep. All right? Yep. Now, there, there's an interesting thing that occurs, and that is that God's laws determine what the beginning point of energy flow is too. Now, the best way I could illustrate that is, again, physically. So, so let's say we have a cliff, right? And let's say you have a rock on the top of the cliff and you're pushing here. Now, many of you in your school age years, you would remember that this rock is in a state of potential energy, is it not? Right? It's not yet moving, but it has a potential, if it's moved to the edge of this cliff, 
it has the potential to do what? To fall. Does that make sense? Now, this person may have to move this rock to get it to the point where the potential is transferred into an actual occurrence. Is that not true? Right? Now, this is exactly how the laws operate to a degree with regard to cause and effect. Here, there's a potential cause sitting, you could say that's the potential cause sitting within the soul. It's the rock in your soul about an issue. Something that's out of harmony of love that needs to get gone, right? Uh, about an issue. When you enact it, you are now basically pushing that particular thought, or feel, thought in this case, to the edge, where it now will be transferred into an action. You follow me? That now is the effect of it being pushed into that direction. Can I just ask about that? Yep. Is that my will and desire in harmony that does that pushing? It's your desire. Is it, your, your will is your current state, yep. wherever you are. Yep. Yep. Your, yep. It's your desire, desire moving now. this. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yep. The cause of every single unloving act you yep. engage is desire to engage that unloving act. Yep. It's desire that's pushing you. It's the desire giving birth. Yep. You okay. follow me? Yeah, so that. here the desire is giving birth. When it gets to here... It's given birth. <laughs> now the action is going to occur no matter what. Mm. You follow me? Mm. Now God looks at what mm. happens when it hits the ground. Now if there were people underneath that rock when it hit the ground, God will look at that and say, right, was this action intentional or accidental? If it was intentional, then you intended to kill these people with this rock. right? Mm. So God, this is the effect of your desire-based action, the cause. You follow? Mm. Right. Now, the same applies if you're going to push something up a hill, does it not? <laughs> Which is really what we're doing when we're trying to progress. This is what we do when we fall, when we sin more and therefore create more difficulties for us. We're basically pushing our rock up the hill when we when we're trying to progress. Again, desire is the cause and the effect is that we finished up using all this effort and we used this effort and we eventually got the rock there and that's the effect. Does that make sense? Positive effect in this case. No damage to anything around us or whatever. So a positive effect, therefore something that can be rewarded. Now, God's laws measure the energy flow within you. So God's laws now can measure the desire. They measure the cause by measuring your desire. And since your desire is an energy that flows in the soul, it is very easily measured by all of God's laws. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Right? The beauty of that, of course, is that now God can measure desire and because he sees all of this going on as well, he can also measure the effects. Mm. And since he knows every effect, he knows better than you do the results of your desire and how bad it is compared to how bad you think it is. Mm. He knows that too. Mm. Yep. And so can you see the will-based process is trying to get rid of the effects of what you've done Right? to the point where, and also try to get rid of the cause but so that you no longer desire to do it. Now you imagine if you've got thousands of things that you're crossing off over years and years of experience in the hills, do you think after you've crossed one off that you're going to do it again? <laughs> Pro probably not, right? It takes a lot of effort. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you would yeah. go, I don't think I want to do that again, wouldn't you? I'm sure I don't. So, so you can see that it has the effect of curing also some of the desire. Yep. You, you follow? Yep. By addressing the will, it also has the effect of curing some of the negative desire. But it doesn't produce new desires. Right. It just cures the old ones that are out of harmony with love. Hopefully. That's, 
hopefully. Yeah. Well, it does. Yeah. yeah. The effect so, of it is that it does. You, so you'll it, never forget that ever, or you could. Yeah, you know, you'll never. No, no yeah. six fear spirit ever forgets right. how they got to the six fear. Okay. They yeah. know it was a lot of very painful effort. Yeah. When they began, most of them are, were in the hills when they began, yeah. and so they know that it's very, very difficult. If you had to go back there and do it all over again, no, none of them wants to want to go back there and do it all over again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's like you building a house that, that turns out to be really, really bad and so someone comes along and bulldozes it. Do you think you're going to want to build it again just for somebody else to come along and bulldoze it? Of course you're not. Yeah. Right? And so that's why they don't. Right? So it actually has cured some of their, unlo or in the end, all of their unloving desires, particularly towards humanity, because right? that's yeah. what the perfect natural yeah. man is. But that's how cause and effect works. Does that make sense to you? Does that help? Yeah, that's, in answering yeah, the question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives you a bit more of a picture of what's going on inside of the soul and yeah. how God measures it yeah, through the energy yeah, flow yeah, yeah. that is actually going on inside of you. Mm. And this is why God can be really exact with everything. Mm. He can be exact. He can even measure, and the effect, part of the effect is the emotions of people that were harmed by your action. And because emotions are energy flows, he can measure every single motion that you caused in other people even. Mm. Yeah. So okay. he can measure everything. What what happened to the energy flow in plants because of what you did? What happened to the energy flow in animals because of what you did? What happened to the energy flow in other humans because of what you did? All of that is able to be measured because it's all based on scientific evidence that God can provide. So everything is exact, mathematically exact, scientifically provable from God's perspective. So the effect is a lot bigger than we realise because of the concentric... Ripples. Yes, it's like yeah. ripple, you know, we often get that sort of image of the ripple effect of dropping a stone in the water yeah. and just seeing the ripples go out and out. And frequently we have no idea how far these ripples extend. Now, based upon what we've learnt about the design of the universe, basically you can see if the soul creates a ripple in the physical universe, it's probably going to extend through the entire physical universe, is mm. it not? Yeah. Yeah, something to think about that, mm, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thanks. Good question. Um, I've only got a few more minutes because I do not want to encroach upon our, our transformation principles. So um, we're going to Rita now. Um, question number four of yours. Well, actually, you've got five or six. If we can start with the one, if God helps, uh, that one. You got that one, Rita? Um, if God helps remove causes, is there still the need to experience all the pain? Um, remember, this is the difference. Remember, this relates to Trist, what Tristan's statement was. There is not going to be a need to experience all the pain, but you're going to have to want to experience all the pain. You do going to have to desire to experience all the pain if that's necessary. And can you see the distinction? Mm -hmm. Because you have the desire to experience all the pain, your repentance would me will mean it will engage a part of God's soul, which is about compassion and forgiveness, and that will mean that you won't have to experience as much pain. But that can only come with a sincere attitude of mm -hmm. the soul towards that process, you see. So you can't go into it thinking... I'm going to get away with some of the pain if I do it God's way. If you go into the process thinking that, you're not going to get away with any of the pain because you're not actually doing it God's way. Does that make sense? Yes, thank yeah, you. So we need to see that distinction. So it's a good question, but I just point out to you, lots of your questions are driven by some Christian spirits that are surrounding you either yesterday, today and today, and they're asking a lot of questions about salvation and redemption and so forth. And while I would like to discuss them, and we will discuss them probably in the Q&As, we won't have time to discuss them now. So my apologies to those spirits who are asking those questions. Thank you. No worries. Um, if we can go to, um, where are we up to, Paddy Jane? Did I do Paddy? Yeah, I did. I did one of yours, didn't I? Oh, yes, that's right. I've marked you off. That's good. I'll cross you out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think many of the other questions we're going to have to leave to our Q&A, actually. Um, 
because some of them are going to take longer for me to answer than the time I've got left, which is only two minutes. So um, I think we're going to have to leave them um, until our Q&A to actually answer them, if that's all right with everybody. Sorry about that. So I just wanted to like to revise just for the moment. You remember, these two things are very important to remember. The human redemption process, which engages will, right? And what it's saying, and remember now with our definition of will is just the current condition. So the human redemption process acts upon the current condition, right? That's what the will principles are acting upon, the current condition, measuring the current condition, trying to correct the current condition. The divine redemption processes, right, acting upon the faith-based desire condition. Can you see why it's more rapid? Because this one is... You desiring change, you desiring to fix up what you've done, you desiring to become aware, desire to know what sin is, a desire to awaken to sin. This is driven by desire, so it's going to be much more rapid as well. Right? That's why it's more rapid. It's driven by the fact you want to know. This one, of course, is very reluctant. You're just being forced into it by the law. So it's very reluctant to actually make the proper corrections. And, and so once you stop the sin process, you're now reluctantly engaging the fact that you've got this long list and you've got to address it. Mm. As you can see, the redemption processes are very, very powerful for your future. You will not get to even the sixth sphere of the spirit world unless you engage at least one of them. But of course, you can see with the will-based process, all of you are already naturally engaging it. God created it that way. So many, much of this emotional pain that comes out of you in little bits and bobs and spurts, you know, when you feel overwhelmed in different moments and you just had to let a little bit go, there's the will-based, the reluctant will-based, right? Redemption process, the human redemption process acting upon your soul to redeem you back to your pristine condition. Now, one of the things I would like to just remind you of in closing, and that is this. Doesn't this demonstrate that no matter what you choose to do, God wants you to at least be happy in the redeemed condition? Right? He's basically saying, I'm going to redeem you whether you want me or not. So whether you want God or not, God is going to redeem you. You just won't experience as much happiness as if you get redeemed by God through a choice-based or a desire-based process. Right? And this should tell us a lot about God's nature. He is not resentful. He is not resentful. Many of you are still acting like he is. Many of you see the law of attraction as a law that means that God's sort of punishing you for something you did wrong. No, he's trying to correct you. What? He's trying to redeem you. He's trying to get you back to a state of happiness. He knows that if you do it reluctantly, well, there's going to be these occasional volcanoes of pain coming out of you mixed with long periods of inaction. He also knows that if you engage the desire-based process, you'll have a consistent progress where each year you'll look back on the previous year and say, wow, I've changed quite a lot from that previous year because I wanted to and because I am trying to get God's help and everyone's help around me, even every tool God has at his disposal, which includes like everything that exists within God's universe, is there to help and assist you. But you've got to want the help. You've got to desire it. And it's got to be a pure, sincere desire. It can't be something you imagine. It has to be real. And, and this means that God is not only 
allowing you to see that firstly he's not resentful but he's also allowing you to see that there's opportunities open to those people who have desires that are not the same opportunities that he has open to those people who do not have desires so many of you after hearing divine truth have shut down your desires purposefully and this is exactly the opposite to what God is trying to achieve with you. God is trying to help you have desires and to purify them, not shut them down. So when some correction occurs to a desire that you have, where, where you're getting feedback that the desire is out of harmony with love, instead of stopping a desire, correct your behaviour. Now, almost all of you as a group did this yesterday. What you did yesterday in Mary's, Q &A, in Mary's start session in the reminders and homework is you got some feedback from Mary the previous session about acting in addiction when you are you know, engaging and telling stories about your homework. And many of you as a result of that no longer engaged desire. But all Mary was trying to do is correct your unloving desire. But many of you get into this state of resentment where you go, oh, now somebody's shutting me down, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to engage anymore. That's you basically turning off the potential of engaging this law and going back to this process. Hence, there will be less benefits. Do you understand? So, so I see this doing as a group, you do this frequently where something, someone gives you a bit of correction, which is correcting your desire, trying to bring it into more harmony with love. And instead of correcting your desire, you say, well, stuff that, I'm going to not have one now. Can you see the pointlessness of such an activity? Such a decision? Desire drives this divine redemption process. Without desire, you're only ever going to be redeemed to the perfect natural human. And even that is going to be a long-winded, reluctant process if you do it that way. Now, you've had eight years, many of you, of long-winded, reluctant process. Are you going to continue with the next eight years of another, of more long-winded, reluctant processes? Or are you going to change and actually engage desires a bit more positively? You know, that's the decision you have to make with regard to this principle, is it not? So let yourself make it. Let yourself work out. Why is it I am so reluctant? Why is it I am so reluctant to develop my desires? What's going on? What, what causes me to do that? Why don't I have faith in God's goodness? Why don't I have faith in God rewarding, compensating me positively for the loving actions I take? Of which developing self-responsibility which is desire for truth, desire for love, desire to see where you sin, desire to have an awakening to self. That's all self-responsibility, isn't it? And there's the rewards of it. It's a huge thing to engage, this desire-based self-responsible action and personal state. And that's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Because if you do that, you'll be on this road which is going to prepare you for the next thing I'm going to discuss with you, transformation. All right? Which is what you want. Okay, thanks for your time, guys.